Welcome to Rising Tide Startups, where we chat with startup founders just like you from all over the globe. Each episode, we bring you practical and actionable tips to help you escape the cubicle and begin your own startup journey. Make sure you take notes. Take it away, Kevin. Here's a quick word from our sponsor, Podbrand Media. As a business owner, new sales leads are essential. At Podbrand Media, we create a branded podcast for you to generate those leads by interviewing your best potential clients as subject matter experts. Not only creating great rapport, but also great content to share in your industry. Affordable and effective. Contact us today at podbrandmedia.com to learn more. This is Kevin Pro with another episode of Rising Tide Startups, and my special guest today is Indus Katan. Indus, thanks for joining us on Rising Tide. Hey, you know, thanks, uh, thanks for the opportunity. It's been uh, we had a little pre-chat here before we hit the record button, and and uh, he he gave me a weather lesson on the the five microclimates of downtown San Francisco uh, with the weather. So he he must be a registered meteorologist too. I mean, on top of everything else he's done, so he's. This is a this is a very uh, eclectic guest we have on today. But unpack a little bit for us. Like if you and I met at a networking event, how would you introduce yourself to me? Well, I grew up in India. You know, did an odd jobs. You know, fled India amongst the the upheaval of the coal mafia. Now living in San Francisco for close or San Francisco Bay Area, close to ten plus years, and a startup founder. And family here. Family here. I have two teenage boys, wife, and um, we live in the suburbs of what I personally call the factory towns of the San Francisco neighborhoods. <laughs> you know, we go out, we work, we come back. <laughs> it's a bedroom community for sure. Bedroom community for sure. Yes. So before we get started, I've got a I've got a really interesting question. You know, somebody that's like at ground zero of San Francisco. I mean. For those of us that live on the other side of the country, you know, all we get is like news reports. So tell me what the current startup climate is like, you know, with the SVB scandal and with, you know, companies moving to Austin, Texas and everything we hear is like everybody's fleeing like a bunch of rats leaving a sinking ship here. But tell me what the real story is on the ground. I'll tell you a secret. It's hot. It's going great guns. And what SVB? That was like. Many, many ages ago. I'm <laughs> kidding. <SVB. laughs> I'm kidding. Silicon Valley Bank, for those that, that don't get, for, we were just using acronyms here. So, yes. So, that was my nutshell, but I think we are back in action. If you've seen the chatter around OpenAI's chat mm -hmm. GPT release yep. and overall momentum, I personally feel this is 1994. Uh, if you remember 1994, when web browser came out, I think the second version of or third version of Netscape Navigator, mm -hmm. 93 was the first version. And all of a sudden, everybody just woke up saying, oh, this is magical. Mm -hmm. Amazon was born. Yahoo was born. The the two engineers at Google were still in undergrad. I think they were in undergrad. They had these ideas. All sorts of new innovation happened in 1994 as a foundational year. And then, you know, up to 1999, we had a great bull run in tech, of course, dot com. I feel this is 2023 is like 1994 hmm. in terms of what's going to happen in the AI in the next five years. What an interesting uh, description. I, I was actually doing another interview earlier this week, and we were talking about, you know, what does email 2.0 look like? And the interesting thing was, as we were thinking, we were thinking, you know, looking back at at Netscape Navigator and Alta Vista and, you know, AOL and some of the earliest web browsers, it virtually is the same thing today with Google. You know, email that started in early to late 80s, early to mid 90s, something like that. So I think it was when I first got my first email address. I mean, it's virtually the same, you know, operation as it was then. But in tech, Everything else, it seems like it's changed, you know, in quantum leaps, you know, but those two th seem pretty consistent from the beginning, from its origin. What do you, what do you think is the next iteration related to, I mean, what is email 2.0 or 3.0, if there is a 3.0 version, what do you think it's going to look like when there's this, a dramatic shift and is AI going to come into play here or chat GP? GPT? I think AI is already playing in the email 
the, the thing which AI is doing now in a very limited way is helping us write and read email. So if you want to write a longer email, give bullets, it'll expand it. If you want to summarize a long email, use chat GPT. I personally feel the 3.0 or 2.0, whatever version it is, I don't think we are going to an email application, say, hey, 2a at john.com, ccb at y.com, mm -hmm. subject line. I think all those constructs are going to be taken away. You will be dictating to a secretary just like you know 50 years ago, mm -hmm. hey, John or hey, Linda, send an email to you know, Jill at acme.com or Jill, Jill at acme, not even .com. And the AI secretary will pick up, oh, you mean Jill? Oh yeah, she sent an email yesterday. You want me to follow up? Okay, good. And here is the draft I'm thinking based on yesterday's content. Mm. You're just dictating to a human-like assistant and the assistant sends an email. You don't you know, figure out what signature you should have what the body copy should have, it's all figured out. The message is automatic. I think that's what we're going to see. And chat GPT could play some amount of role, but we'll see layers being built on top of chat GPT to accomplish these. Mm. Yeah, that that would be it. And, and it's interesting to see them because it's still, you know, very much early days of you know, the capabilities of, of AI. But um, I, I have a, a kind of a weird theory about what I think it's going to look like. I think it's going to be some kind of identifier that is like bringing all of these different channels like together. Like hmm. it's almost like a, you think I'm, I, what I'm thinking of in my mind is a, like a QR code type thing where it says where everything intersects, but it's not a QR code. It's whatever the next iteration of a QR code looks like, you know, that, that is this personal you know, um, it's not a number, it's not a, it's not an email address, but it's something that, you know, if, if you, you want to say, hey, send something to Amy at Acme Company, it, it doesn't go to Twitter, it doesn't go to Instagram, it doesn't go to Facebook, it doesn't go to email, it, it just goes to Amy, you know, mm. like, in a, you know, kind of a strange... Short way. circuits, all these channels just go directly to Amy. Or, or brings them all together, somehow, <laughs> you know, somehow it merges, like, it's the Zapier of... <laughs> of email communication you know so anyway i i'm the host of a podcast i have no idea what it's gonna look like so but it's uh it is interesting to to hear you you know describe you know how you view you know san francisco and silicon valley you know right now in that in that space but i i am really interested in talking about you and your journey so talk to us about you know what happened before 10 years ago, before you arrived in San Francisco? What led you to that point? And kind of give us the quick, you know, journey through the last 10 years or so up to today. Like every immigrant entrepreneur, uh, you know, sometimes I may sound more cliche than others. You know, you arrive with dreams and aspirations, you know, to the promised land of this nation with, you know, $500 in your pocket. Mm. And start a family, buy a home, and one thing leads to other. You start a business, you own a business, sell that business, and part of your American dream you know, get, starts getting fulfilled. And that's the blessing I've had in the last 10 years. Before that, I grew up in India in a small mining town where dusty roads and polluted air and corrupt government officials would have their fiefdoms. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, Somehow I get an undergrad degree in computer science and luckily computer science became the hot thing. I, yeah. In my wildest imagination, I had no idea. It was just a stroke of randomness that you know computer science happened and one thing leads to other. And uh, I worked for a few companies that were, that became very popular later and then started a business, moved to this country and life feels so normal, you know, when I talk to someone or who, have, who has known me in the past, so you are exactly the same, but your life has changed. Mm. And that's how I describe it, that you know, we grew up where we grew up. Those are our roots. But now what we have become is what we are right now. Yeah. Uh, so is, was there an exit somewhere along the line where it, it just changed the, the rules of the game for you, where you said, now I can actually work on stuff I want to work on? So we got lucky with an exit. So in 2010, three of us started a security company. If you remember when iPhone came out, mm -hmm. every company executive and employee wanted to access corporate data on an iPhone. Mm. Yep. 
what was the de facto device? It was a BlackBerry. Mm -hmm. And people said, oh, no effing way. I don't want a BlackBerry. I need an <laughs> iPhone. But IT would not allow it. They said, yeah. no, the standard device is BlackBerry. <clears throat> and, you know, there'll be continuous amount of friction. You cannot authenticate yourself because of corporate rules. We found a hack to get your iPhone connected to your corporate intranet. Wow. And if you do that, then magic, you could access your shared folders, your emails and whatnot. So using that as a foundation, we built a business uh, and a company. We sold that company finally to Oracle in 2014. And that exit, in a way, taught us many things, but also, oh, what else can we do? This sounds like easy, proverbially. And then... <laughs> Went on to you know start Quolum, which is my second startup in this journey, and then looking forward to building a great business on top of it. I mean, it's a pretty good leap from 2010 to 2023. So, when did when did you start Quolum? So Quolum was 2019, late summer. Um, I was working for a company called Chargebee, that is now a subscription management unicorn. And post charge B started column and now a team of 28, 29 that we have between United States and Bangalore. So, so many startups, uh, so many successful, I think, start or really products that grow into companies were started because the founder was actually scratching his own itch, so to speak. Did you build this because you had the need for the service? Column to a certain extent. Yes. So when I was at Charge B, we saw close to 150 plus applications being used, many by my team. And we were using spreadsheets for keeping the record of what applications are being used. Now, in all fairness, it was so early in the days of SaaS that finance could not catch up. You know, Somebody who is an intern will bring up a tool. Oh, I need this application to get my job done. It's mm -hmm. $20 per user per month. And I, as a manager, said, okay, go ahead. Yep. Harmless $20. Sooner or later, that 20 will become 200 mm -hmm. because you got some more paid features. And then one user will get multiplied by five because mm -hmm. other people loved it. Finance is trying to tackle this, but they have no idea. And this just balloons very rapidly. And I thought there must be a better way to solve it. We looked at other applications out there, could not find any. And then the idea just hung up on me for some time. But then, you know, newer set of tools got bought and say, hey, we got to fix this. So I quit right. charge being started. So it became from a personal, I would not use the word itch, but, you know, as an engineer, you want to find solutions to like, mm -hmm useless problems at that time now becomes useful later. So that, that was a starting point. And I, I mean, as, as you described it, it's not just that one application that you start stacking applications on top of each other. And then you're really talking some, some serious money. It's on people's personal credit cards. It's, you know, it, it renews automatically at the end of the year, you're not keeping up with it. And, and it's just this snowball that keeps, you know, kind of rolling along, but I would tell him since 2019, um, and right at the right at the beginning of COVID. So what what has been kind of the growth pattern of Qualum since that time? So when we started 2019, I didn't have a product in mind. I had a clear direction that this is going to be a problem. Somebody has to solve it. How do we solve it was unknown. Do we do a fancy dashboard where we bring all the application? Do we do uh, an integration with an accounting system or multiple accounting systems where we you know, siphon off the invoices and the expense data and then kind of annotate it saying, hey, what do you have or you don't have? Do we be in the flow of money saying, hey, here's a card, put all the corporate expenses around software on file on this card and it will automatically track. So there were ideas, but not a concrete product. And by the time we started working on it, we started writing code 2019, December with a couple of engineers. By the time we had something which was showable, COVID happens. Mm -hmm. And all my engineers, like three of us were, were in India. I was in, I was in India, in Bangalore on, I think, 6th or 5th of March. I don't know, but yeah, I think 5th of March. 
just like 15 days or, or 10 days before there was a lockdown on international yeah. travel. So I scrambled, my wife would call me, hey, are you sure? You know, you want to spend like a few more days, you'll get stuck. There won't be any flights back home. <laughs> but, you know, I got out slightly earlier than usual. But the, the problem happened, the engineers were stuck. We were yeah. disconnected. They didn't have internet service at home. So we had a two month of literal stall in our in our planning, in our execution. But then things started picking up. We got some more engineers on board and then, you know, we are building the product. So it's been, it was rocky during COVID, but then, you know, we just learned to survive and then come out of this. I honestly think, and I mean, we can't even, I thought we were all going to be dead hmm. because no vaccine in yep. sight. Yeah. People were dying, unknown numbers. Mm -hmm nothing concrete from the press or the media or the pharma or even the politicians. So, okay, where is the end game? What do I do now? But yeah, yeah came out of it. Did, uh, at, at the beginning were, were, I guess your assumptions, you know, slightly anecdotal or did you really like talk to a lot of, you know, CTOs and, you know, folks out there that, that would, you know, Hey, is this a problem? Is it big enough to build something around it, you know, type thing? And what, what does it look like? What does it need to look like? What kind of market research did you do? So when we, when I started Colum, just after I quit charge B, I talked to around 10 CFOs and the results, the answers were mixed. They said, yes, this is something is important, but I don't want it now. I'm not interested in, in it right now. Or I'm not interested in that now sometimes was mm -hmm. like hidden in between what they want to say. The reason was there was too much money chasing the startups. They're, they're flush with cash. Yep. CFOs, if you look at their priority, number one is revenue. How can I get more money in, into, the, into the company? How can I get more customers? Expense line items were much below the radar and software is number two expense. So first is people. They said, no, 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 important, but not right now. Please come back later. So we had some good feedback on the product itself, but very poor response on whether somebody is going to pay for this. And, but we kind of persisted. And when we did the first version of the fully built product, which is 2021 December, like a rough sketch of what we're working on. That's when the CFO said, oh, this is interesting. And at, by that time, I had talked to almost 150 people. Mm -hmm. So earlier, the sample was small. But once we had something very tangible, we showed it to almost 150 people. And these were the CFOs who were not connected or known to me. These were like in my second degree on LinkedIn. I would do right. cold outreaches and they would take a phone call or a 15 minute call and give me a feedback. And we continue building in that. I'll give you one more song by on that. We did have a product which was a, a finance related directly from a you know flow of money perspective. They said, yes, I would use it. I like the value prop, but I would only use it once every quarter or once every month. Mm -hmm. And my question to them was, what would make you use this every day or every week? And the answer they gave us, be in the flow of money. With that, we went back to the drawing board, added what we now have, world's first software purchase card. Mm. And that completed our story. We released the product in 2022 and we added beta customers. Now we have close to 25 paying customers. And amazingly, in terms of that journey from nothing to idea to feedback to build up. So is that is that software purchasing card, is it actually a card or is it a kind of a white labeled overlay, like the front door that they, you would go into and then there's actual companies behind it. There are actual pay merchants or actual cards, or is it actually the, the card itself? Does that make sense? It's actually a card itself. Think of that card as an Amex on steroids for software mining. Hmm. So it's a virtual card. We don't ship plastic because you're yep. making all digital purchases. Right. Let's say you want to buy Zoom. You take that 16-digit number, put it on file on Zoom. We authorize those transactions in real time. And based on your rules, Jill can buy Zoom for $500 as a rule. 
would authorize the transaction, let it go through, automatic collection of the invoice, reconciliation, pushing of that transaction to your accounting system, and counting the number of licenses and users on that transaction. Mm -hmm. So imagine you see a statement line item immediately after the transaction goes through, you double click on it, it'll show you how many users, what were the invoices, how much did they use? What does the product do? And it'll automatically push this to your QuickBooks or your NetSuite. So we that's the loop that completes with the card. So I'm going to expect a royalty on this, but I mean, as my entrepreneurial gears are spinning, I'm thinking then you've also got to negotiate on the back end with this, with the service providers to give them a discount on the subscriptions, you know, if they would use this card. So you know that that would give an extra incentive for companies to actually use this. But you uh, you mentioned CFOs uh, that you talked to. I would think this would almost be as important to CTOs. You know, because I I want to know what's my budget. Am I staying within my my departmental budget? What subscriptions are out there? Who has licenses? You know that type of thing. Is it? Do you see a use case there as well? I think it is, and you're hundred percent correct but we have not been successful to crack the mindset of a proverbial CTO because they are worried. And, and, it's, and the reason is you as a CTO want to know where is your budget, but your priority for other things are at the top, your yeah. application performance, your security, engineering yeah. velocity and others. So the money comes at the bottom of the priority in top four, top five. They want to solve it. They want to see it solved, but they are not actively pursuing a solution. They only care at the end of a fiscal year. <laughs> yeah, because it's a, hey, you know, this is careful. Right. Yeah, because the CTO is being judged on application performance on other items, not by the spend. Luckily, the software spend is still a lower number compared to engineering spend. Mm -hmm. So it's okay for now, but I feel sooner or later, just like, you know, I'll give you an analogy. Let's say you are manufacturing cars. What is the direct spend? Your sheet metal, your paint, your parts, your labor, right? Like three or four things, just an abstract. For software, sooner or later, your APIs, your mm -hmm. cloud, these are or your two direct spend. And as the cost of API and, and the number of APIs keep growing, the CTO will wake up and say, oh, why am why is my software expensive? Yep. because my APIs are. So let's find a cheaper one. Let's be more optimistic and, you know, performant on APIs. Yeah, that I mean, it makes perfect sense that, that uh, yeah, there, there's a little bit of a now and later, you know, that they have to deal with for sure. But um, I've got one other question I want to ask you before we kind of get drilled down just into, you know, like founder space. But the, the question that, that came up when you were talking earlier is, is, you know, that they weren't concerned about it or CFOs weren't concerned about it because, you know, money was easy and they were just concerned about like VC money coming in and, you know, revenue sources and things like that. But when, when markets tighten, is that a benefit to you? So like when there's less VC money available or they get a little more concerned about the software side of things than, than they would if money was just flowing like a fountain? I would say yes, because until 2022, January, we would get proverbial middle finger whenever we outreach to a CFO because, hey, yeah, I know I should be worrying about my spend, but right now I'm worrying about revenue. Mm -hmm. Hence, nobody paid attention. We had zero customers who were paying any money to us. And when markets tightened up, if you remember last year, I think March was when DocuSign stock got bludgeoned. It, mm -hmm. it collapsed it, like 50% of the, the high. And suddenly people woke up and say, oh, I need to control costs. I need to see my spend. And then we started getting inbound. So I think at least it looks like, and I don't want to fortune tell about us, knock on wood, <laughs> we, we are seeing a counter cyclical behavior where, you know, there is more interest in us than it was 12 months ago. So hopefully we can ride this a uh, little bit of a tailwind to build a much more deeper foundation of a longstanding product. Mm -hmm. I um I have a, an interesting I'm shifting gears on you here a little bit. I have an interesting theory about about entrepreneurs that um I think there are two types out there. 
there is the type that, you know, it's kind of the nature versus, versus nurture argument. So I, I think there are some that are just wired to start things. You know, they're just creative. That's the, the gears are always spinning. They, they come up with a hundred ideas a day. They just have to figure out which one they want to chase type thing. And then there are others that, that find problems that they, they solve and they're really good. Not at, not only at just creating something that solves a, an interesting problem, but they're very good at maintaining as well. So they almost have an engineer mindset versus an entrepreneurial mindset. So which one would, would which camp would you think you fell into? I feel like you just described both the camps for me. <laughs> <laughs> I am the perfect balance. <laughs> well, I, and that, you know, it's funny because as I was trying to, you know, like pigeonhole you into one or the other, I'm thinking, I, I really don't know where he's going to fall when I ask this question. So that's a great answer. Yeah, I, I'm reflecting on, on your description because, you know, as an entrepreneur, you want to find the problem that, you know, absolutely enamors you right that hey i gotta solve it nobody else gonna solve it but you cannot be that person while the journey of the solution continues to solve yet another problem you know in the larger domain you find a problem you start solving it stick to it you know mm -hmm. focused mindset and you nurture and i'm using your description you nurture that problem to see a very large light at the end of the tunnel yeah um Otherwise, you just become, uh, what's the right word? You keep iterating on finding newer problems and solutions without creating something big out of it. Mm. It's an inch deep and a mile wide. Yeah. <laughs> so do you think it's important for entrepreneurs to be passionate about what they're, about their product or service, or does it matter? I think it does matter. And it also, it also matters based on who you are as an entrepreneur. Um, and I have this analogy of, you know, are you a pioneer slash explorer or are you a settler? Are you a town planner? Are you a diplomat? Because if you are a pioneer or an explorer by nature, you got to be passionate because you cannot find that proverbial gold if you do not desire to dig like 200 meters down mm -hmm. below. Yeah, and yeah. it's your own passion that's going to help you find it um, versus if you are a settler or a diplomat, you're looking at other people's passion and manage their motivation to get what you want. Mm -hmm. So I think you have to chisel what, what you are. I think most entrepreneurs who do it big, take it big, they are passionate about it in the first four or five years of the journey. And then they become you know, the the diplomats and the settlers to manage people's motivation and get yeah. the max out of them. Yeah. Cast, you're still casting vision, but you're casting vision for your team as much as the, the product itself. So that, that's a that's a great description. I um I I'm curious, like you know, you mentioned, you know, it's it's really incumbent on founders to to you know focus on one thing and kind of head to that light you know just to make sure you're you stay the course type thing but what is the determining factor in your mind that would cause you to say this is a dead end it is time to pivot it's time to stop stop throwing money down a black hole um, what is that what is that uh, epiphany moment that you have what what are, what are the characteristics or the warning signs Great question. I think it's a time-bound sales velocity as an answer or time-bound customer acquisition as an answer. And I would say if for 18 months you did not grow your customer count to 2x of where you are, you don't have a very big market. And it kind of depends on a lot of things. Are you in venture-funded business? Are you mom and pop, small business, like a restaurant and all that? Are you able to meet your needs on a daily basis? Like highly mm -hmm. profitable, breaking even, making your ends meet, but yeah, not growing dramatically. But as a, as a venture business, as a tech entrepreneur, I think the sales velocity or customer acquisition makes sense. Doesn't matter how deep the market is. If you are very early in the market, right? You'll have one customer a day, maybe five customers a year later a day. Are you 
in that zone in that 18 month period if you still have that one customer you have built a niche problem yeah. solution statement it's not a, a venture scale business that's mm -hmm. going to go like you know millions of revenue dollars of revenue that is that is when you should you know figure out the fork in the road shall i call it quits or just make it a lifestyle business and keep doing it mm -hmm. or is there a third option that says Maybe I just haven't found that product market fit, that exact fit. There could be, I could, I could have, you know, I need to recalibrate a little bit, you know, uh, based on maybe feedback or just the analytics of, you know, what you're seeing. But that that's a great description. I, I love the way you, you kind of frame that. So share with me and share with our audience, you know, just act like you're talking to those that are further behind you on the journey. You know, they're just getting started. They're sitting in the cube thinking, hey, I've got to start something. I, I'll go crazy if I sit here any longer, you know. What are one or two just really foundational principles that you wish you would have known when you first started, you know, leading a company um, that you think are, you know, are pretty agnostic? They don't, they're not industry specific, but just, just generic general principles that would you think would be really helpful to those that are just getting started i think, I think number one is quit your job if you're still working burn the boats huh <laughs> burn the boards you, you, there's no plan b give yourself easy six months that hey i'm gonna start i'm resigning tomorrow i'm gonna give myself six months whether i can do it or not if not fine it, this is not the life that is made for me I cannot do this, I'll go back. But at least you're doing justice to yourself. And the reason I say that, because the last thing that anybody wants to do is have regrets. I didn't do this. Oh, I should have done that. To minimize that regret, first thing is quit the job, start it. I, that, that's number one. Number two is find who you are from a sales versus a builder perspective if at least in tech you got to have a builder mindset can you write code can you design stuff because you're a team of one when you decide to start so you have to have at least one trait which is very foundational right if you are a builder you know you quit your job you starting to build so build a prototype and then show it to people put it on linkedin it so at least luckily today you know it passed over to now and in back then, when I started, LinkedIn as this channel did not exist where you could show off what you're working on and people will come and applaud and support you. That's what you need. So show it off on LinkedIn. Hey, I did this AI chat project on top of OpenAI, GPT, whatever. What do you guys think? And then take the feedback. So if you're not a builder, fine. You are in sales. You know how to talk to people. Pick up the phone and call like 50 people. Hey, I'm thinking about this idea. You know, I'm a sales guy. I don't know how to build it. Would you buy if I get it built? Mm. Bingo. Yeah. That's your calling. As easy as that. I love it. I, I love it. It's uh and it and you you really do have to have thick skin because if you're gonna throw it out to the marketplace, you're gonna expect there's there's gonna be 10% that hate it, 10% that love it, and 80% that don't care. So yeah, you know, it is interesting. It is, it's a great, it's a great uh channel to you know to to have things tested you know and and to get feedback on but uh yeah i love it i um i i'm curious uh let's let's go back to qualum for just a second what do you anticipate it's going to look like you know 18 months from now 36 months from now what did i mean obviously you know taking your own medicine proverbial medicine so to speak you know you're you're staying the course so obviously it, it's growing you know enough to to indicate that, hey, we're kind of on the right path here. But uh, what is it going to look like? Yeah, we are still very early. Uh, I'll say this. Every customer conversation is answering the question, do I have product market fit? I kid you not. Even after 25 paying customers, every customer conversation is exactly like that. Do we have product market fit? You know, what did that customer say? Does, it, does he hate it? Does he like it? Will he use this feature or not? And I think... Using that as a foundation, we will continue to build this brand new category of SaaS procurement. Doesn't exist in its current form. If you follow this whole you know, spend management as a larger category, it is all about direct 
spend, which is, you know, let's go back to our automobile manufacturing example. There is spend management for manufacturing. Why? Because you're buying paint, sheet metal, labor, parts, supplies, what have you to get the car built and everything else in construction, it's all direct spend. Hence, you need software to manage the inventory. You need analytics on top, who shipped it on time, payments have been done, invoices. It's a whole lot of enchilada. Imagine that exact philosophy being adopted to software. It is going to happen, hasn't happened. Today, how do we build software? You go buy five APIs, you go buy 15 different tools, you start writing code. Nobody is looking at what you've bought and it goes to production. Customers start using it. Still, people have no clue what's powering your business. Yep. So I think there'll be a world where all of these backend tools which power your own tech business become part of your supply chain. And to manage that, you need analytics. You need all the automation which has been done traditionally in spend and supply chain for software. That's the world we are chasing very early. I think it's going to change in 18, 24 months. Thanks to this little bit of softness in the market, people have woken up. They are being rational about it. They want to control the bills of material. If I have to sell this product as $30 per user per month, what is my cost of building it? People have started waking up to that. I think that's the that's a dream we are chasing. I um yeah, it's interesting. Just the vision. I mean, it's very few people that I have on here that actually talk about we are creating a category. You know, normally we're just improving on something that it, that currently exists. So it's it is uh this this will be an interesting uh, exciting journey to watch from uh, from afar. So, and I really appreciate you just sharing sharing your time today. Is there Anything that we haven't touched on, you just like to close this out with today, you think would be be good for our audience to know? Yeah, I think uh, AI is a game changer. I think we touched upon very briefly. And if I could use the nuggets that we discussed, I think you know, it's time to build again from an AI perspective. I think we did a great run in software as a service for the last eight, 10 years. And the inflection point to me personally, and you'll not believe this, so most of the time you're watching the venture funding dollars as an indicator of success in software. For a change in the last 20, year, 20 years, we are watching the papers written on AI being published by academic institutions as an indicator for success in this new category. So imagine these convergence of the dollars and the academic papers. That to me feels like there's something brewing for the next 10 years. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely, for sure. That's that's an interesting confluence of of two disparate parties <laughs> out there that have been in the in the past. But Indus, thank you so much for just taking time. I know you've got a busy schedule and you've got a team to lead, but uh, really enjoyed the chat and uh, learned a great deal. You know, been a very short period of time, and I just appreciate you sharing your insights and your history and experiences and hope for the future, and just really playing your part in helping all boats rise in a rising tide. Indus, have a great weekend. Thank you, Kevin, for having me. We hope you heard some great takeaways. Make sure you follow up with our guests today and show them the support they deserve. As always, thank you for listening and playing your part in helping all boats rise in a rising tide.